Good evening. We're continuing our series looking at individuals where their faith had the ability, the strength to overcome. And of course, when we're talking about faith, we are putting our reliance on God Almighty. We are trusting in Him. Our faith is in someone, and that faith is in God. Father, Son, and Spirit. Of course, we can talk about having our faith in Jesus Christ, and that is totally appropriate because we trust in Him. We trust in what he, who He is and also what He did for us on the cross. We trust in God Almighty. Today, we are taking a look at Moses. Moses had great faith, and he had faith that overcomes. And so we'll be taking a look at him and looking at three aspects of his faith that hopefully we can add into our personal lives. The first thing we see with Moses is that his faith was one of endurance. And very specifically, I want to point out a couple of things we see in the book of Hebrews. And we will read the text about Moses in Hebrews 11 near the end of the lesson tonight. We're told in Hebrews that he was willing to withstand or endure mistreatment. In fact, he chose mistreatment and he chose reproach over the pleasures of sin. He could have stayed in Pharaoh's home. He could have stayed in the situation that provided so much worldly extravagance, so much worldly wealth. But he chose to be on God's side he chose mistreatment and reproach over that. And of course, he was able to endure that. This is labeled something where he, he went from a, from a worldly standpoint, went from something very comfortable, something very nice, to something that was, again, from a worldly standpoint, not so nice, not so comfortable. In fact, with these labels, mistreatment and reproach, we also see really quickly in the book of Hebrews that the mistreatment, there, there are some phrases added to these words. The mistreatment was with the people of God. And so if we are mistreated because of our faith, if we are held in reproach, we know that we are on a team. We're part of a family. And Moses knew that too. He was with the people of God. But notice something else about Moses. And of course, this is way before the Messiah came. This is way before Christ. But it was the reproach of Christ. When we suffer as Christians, when we withstand some persecution, which in our society, we don't have to withstand much, of course. But when we do, it's the reproach of Christ. It is the reproach that, that he carries, that the world gives him. We are given because we are his body. Unbelievable concept, unbelievable unity that in this life we don't really even understand. We don't, we don't get the full strength or the gravity of being united with Jesus Christ. We don't understand fully in this life what it means to be his body. But Moses, he had a faith that was willing to endure the mistreatment with the people of God and the reproach of Christ. So let's look at uh, some of the text here. This is right at the beginning of the, the story in the Bible of Moses. And notice how quick this turns. We don't we, we talk about Moses being put in the basket. We talk about uh, just all the things about Moses and his uh, birth and childhood. His birth is in verse 1 here in Exodus 2. And then by verse 10, he is being given back to Pharaoh's daughter. When the child grew older, she brought him into Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. And then the very next verse, one day, when Moses had grown up, 
he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. And we know, of course, that a combination of events, Moses being fearful, Moses killing an Egyptian, led to him departing from the land of Egypt and heading to Midian, where he marries and, and stays out there, um, away from Egypt for, for quite a while, till God calls him back, which in the narrative is not too far down in the verses, as a matter of fact. So we, we very quickly get to the point where God is calling Moses to lead his people out of the land of Egypt. In 1 Peter, we read two different sections, actually, in his first letter, talking about the suffering that Christians or the, 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 the suffering that Christians may have to endure because of being Christians, but also because of being righteous, because of doing the right things. And first in chapter 4, and then we'll go back and just look at one verse in chapter 3, as you can see. In 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 19, we read, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. We're reminded of the Beatitudes, where the last one is about persecution. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Can you imagine, he's saying, we're going to be judged if we're being saved, as he says in verse 18, by the hair of our chinny chin chin, perhaps, then what about people who don't belong to Christ? It's just unbelievable. They won't have a chance, is what Peter's saying making a contrast here between those in Christ and those out. Verse 17 again, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And this is what Moses in his context was willing to do. He entrusted himself. He entrusted his soul to God Almighty. Then we go back into chapter 3. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. We've got a Savior whom we can trust, who we can trust. We have a Savior, savior who has already paid the price for us. We have a Savior who we can surely entrust our souls to without hesitation or reservation. Moses had a faith that endured, endured mistreatment, endured the reproach of Christ, he had a faith that overcomes. And we, of course, can have the same. Something else we see in Moses' faith is that it was personal. He had a relationship with God. We are called to have a relationship with God also, but God the Son particularly. We are asked and we are blessed to be able to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. In Numbers, we read about a time where Moses' sister and brother were not happy with them. him. Uh, we, Greg mentioned uh, the relationships between siblings this morning as he talked about Mary and Martha. And here we have a little bit of sibling rivalry uh, going on as well. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. 
for he had married a Cushite woman. And so Miriam and Aaron, they're just, they have a problem with this. They don't like it, obviously. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the Lord hears everything, obviously, but the Lord took note of this. He was attentive to this. He responded to this. Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out. And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Arian, Aaron and Miriam. He had called all three, but now he's saying, Okay, Aaron and Miriam. Uh, they came forward. He said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. The Lord's pointing out to Aaron and Miriam, yeah, I do these things. And then we have the word but, or not so, with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, in contrast to the regular prophet, if there's such a thing, with him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Oftentimes when God speaks to someone, whether it's in a dream or a vision, or even more directly, a lot of times it would be to the prophet as if a riddle, something that wasn't quite clear. A lot of times the prophets are given statements to say and things to preach that we understand a couple thousand, three thousand years later, because we have the whole of the word of God. We can put it all together. But these, these prophets sure did not. Even ungodly people would prophesy for the Lord sometimes, such as uh, Pilate and others, or the high priest in the New Testament. So why then God asking Miriam and asking uh, Aaron, why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. What we learn here about Moses' faith is that it was different. It was strong. There was a personal relationship with the Lord. Now here, that's all God asks. Miriam, why weren't you afraid? And then Miriam gets leprosy, uh, gets some sort of skin disease, and she has to bear that for seven days. Moses intercedes on her behalf, and she doesn't have to stay that way. She is healed after the week of disgrace, the week of, the week of trouble. Paul talks about wanting this kind of personal relationship with the Lord. He says in Philippians 2, 8 through 11, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection of from the dead. The Apostle Paul sure had an amazing relationship with Christ. And of course, it all began with him persecuting Christ, him trying to put Christ followers either in prison or to death. But Paul came to have, I don't want to say an unsurpassed, but a very strong faith in the Lord. We're reminded in his passage here, we see the word no twice. This meant a lot to the Jews. This meant something very intimate. This was not just having knowledge about someone. This was knowing the person, knowing them. And very, very important. Moses had that kind of faith as well, a faith that overcomes. 
And then finally, we see that Moses had a faith that was obedient. Uh, he was willing to uh, put his actions, uh, put his faith into actions. He was willing to be true to what he believed and in his uh, true to his relationship uh, with God. So now let's read our Hebrews passage that we've referenced a few times. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. This is when he killed the Egyptian. He was fearful for his life and took off. But he did it for a reason. He saw his people being persecuted, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the approach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Earlier in this chapter in Hebrews, we find out why these people of faith were able to succeed, why they were able to do what they were able to do. And we're told it was because they knew that they belonged somewhere else. They were citizens of a different country, heaven. They belonged to God Almighty. If we remember that as well, we will be able to... Whatever hardships we might have, whether they are for Jesus Christ specifically or just part of what our world is dealing with, like the coronavirus right now, we are dealing with something of a crisis. We are dealing with a pandemic. We are dealing with something that is not convenient for anyone and, of course, very detrimental to some. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. We know a little bit about the treasures of Egypt. We know a little bit about the treasures of the United States of America. We live in a very affluent place. And he considered, and we should consider, the reproach of Christ being persecuted on his behalf. We should consider that greater wealth. That should be much more valuable to us than whatever treasures might be around us. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. And then just to complete the Moses story, by faith the people crossed the Red Sea on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned, finishing the Moses narrative in the book of Hebrews. The next is by faith, uh, the destruction of Jericho. And then the statement, I could go on and on, the Hebrew writer says. I could, you know, why shouldn't I mention, mentions a bunch of people. And then ends his narrative here about people of faith. Well, let's look at verse 28. By faith he kept the Passover, sprinkled the blood. He did the things that God called him to do. And of course we see his obedience throughout the story of his life. But here, very particularly, especially on the Lord's Day, we are reminded of the Passover. We're reminded of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who takes away the sins of the world. So in Exodus 12, we have this narrative. And I'm not going to read even half of these 32 verses, but 1, 2, 7, 14, and then the last paragraph just to give us a feel for what's happening. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. So this, what's happening here, this 10th plague, this Passover, this is going to change the calendar for the Jews in the same way that the calendar was changed at the time of Christ for the whole world, basically. Uh, amazing. But here, the, the calendar has changed for the people of God. Seven, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. So they're going to eat this Passover meal. They're going to put blood on the doorposts. And that's how the destroyer will know to pass over that house, to go to the next. Verse 14, this day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. 
so much that could be said about the Passover. Josh mentioned this feast at the Lord's table this morning in our worship. You can check that out watching this morning's uh, live stream recording. But the last paragraph, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he, the Pharaoh, summoned Moses and Aaron by night. He didn't hesitate, brought them in right away, and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone. And then notice, and bless me also. One little gasp here before he pursues them. One little gasp, I think, of, of sorrow and repentance. A little bit of a turning here, uh, which did not last long, of course, with Pharaoh. And one last passage for tonight. Let's all strive to have an endurance like Moses a relationship with the Lord like Moses had, and let's all strive to be obedient as he was. He's even mentioned in the book of Revelation, as you can see, uh, chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying. So here, just kind of bringing together, realize how Moses is labeled here. He's a servant of the Lord. We are called to be servants of righteousness. We are called to no longer be a slave to sin or a servant of sin, but to be transformed to be a servant of righteousness. And of course, ultimately a servant of well. And this is also called the song of the Lamb, the Lamb Jesus Christ. And they sing this saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways. O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. May the Lord bless you and keep you this evening or at whatever time you're watching this video. Let's all strive to grow in our faith during this time of quarantine. Let's try to come out of this stronger than we've ever been before.